Mumbai Bicycle Club. Welcome to Amsterdam. Hello. Thank you. For Thank you for us. having us. You went out yesterday, right? Briefly. We cut in at about 11 and went to see some friends. And uh, we liked just walking around and looking at all the really confused tourists. So, like, we th when you're when you're sober and you're walking around the main square, it's hilarious. Just people watching. Because I had a discussion with uh, English people lately about uh, Amsterdam. And I said, well, Amsterdam has a really bad reputation in England for uh, all the hen parties and the stag parties. Mm. And I said, yeah, sure. But you're forgetting the fact that it's British people who are holding those parties here. Exactly. Yeah, British people must have a bad reputation in Amsterdam for the hen parties and stag we parties. Were, we were talking about it last night, actually. We were thinking, uh, you know, people must hate us here. It's like probably how we feel about Australians in London, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was the closest we could get to the comparison, you know. Have you guys been here before? You've, uh, like, you just told me, uh, probably Holland is one of the first countries that you guys went to. I, I actually think it's the first place we played outside of the UK. In It must have been 2007 or 2008, we did the British anthems at the no, Paradiso. Did, yeah, yeah. And actually, the, the videos online, we were just discussing how terrible it is. <laughs> I don't think any, it's not worth it. We both look and sound awful. So we're surprised that we got invited back, but here we are, <laughs> six years later, you know. What do you actually think of that? Because, I mean, there's so so many, so much content out there on any band, basically. I mean, like you said, it's, you think it's horrible. Uh, mm. I probably, the, the fans back to differ, they like it. Well, just imagine, you know, you go back to your parents' house and you find your diary under your, your old bed, and it's from like 10 years ago, and you're reading it, and you're like, oh, I was such an idiot. But then someone gets that and puts it on YouTube for the whole world to see. And that's kind of similar to what's happened to us. Yeah. Oh, but then you guys are probably way too self-critical because uh, I think you guys uh, pulled off some uh, some amazing stuff in the past. Um, one thing that strikes me is that you guys are one of the few bands who can pull it off to totally change their style mm. with every new album. Um, the Beastie Boys did that. Primal Scream did it. The Beatles did it. And you guys did it. We're the fourth, the fourth band in the history of the world. Um, I think we're kind of a restless band. And every time we do something, we maybe grow tired of it and want to do something different. And um, The albums that we make just reflect what we're listening to at the time. So it's not like a master plan to always be different. It's just a natural sort of uh, progression, I think, for our, our tastes. You know? It sounds logical, but it, it is actually hard for a band to do that, right? Why? I don't, I'm not sure if it's hard. It's certainly more exciting doing that. You know, you see other bands and they make the same album three or four times and it, it gets boring to listen to and it certainly must get boring to do yourself, just trying to recreate something that you've already achieved in the past. I, I'd actually say it's harder to try and do that and stay enthusiastic about it. I think the difficulty is, is um, you, you can change your sound as much as you want, but beneath the sound needs to be a pop song. And so I think we've managed to do that. No matter how, no matter how we dress up the song in whatever clothes we want, whatever sound we want, when you undress it, it's going to be a, a good pop song. And that's the, the consistent thing throughout the albums. But of course, there's also an argument that you might lose all your fans who, for instance, like your acoustic stuff. Mm -hmm. Now they listen to the new album, they go like, well, this is not what I was into. Well, I guess hopefully we're trying to get just a very contained, small, but passionate group of fans, you know, which is the best. You don't want 700,000 people following you on Twitter, for instance. Yeah, well, I think it's about quality, not quantity, when you have fans, you know. Yeah, but I mean, I think at least half of them are really big fans, you know what I mean? So you have like yeah. maybe a million fans. That, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah. It is a fact, you know, <laughs> right? I mean. We think that maybe on Twitter there might be a lot of robots. We're not sure. We're. We think Twitter's maybe a conspiracy. We have an unproportionately large amount of Twitter followers. It, it makes no sense. <laughs> Or maybe we're being hard on ourselves. I don't know, but it, it seems unbelievably large considering our tweets, you know. Yeah, but on the, on the subject of social media, you guys are not really on there, right? I mean, I try to find some extra information. Normally, it's fun to read what bands are doing. Like, mm -hmm. most people are tweeting, like, we're in Amsterdam, we're doing this or whatever. None of that for you guys. I think we're just we're trying to keep the mystery there because we're really, really very uninteresting people. So <laughs> we like to to make people at least think that there's something going on. Really, we're just sitting at home with our parents, like drinking tea. 
I think on Twitter it's got a bit out of hand, really, with bands tweeting everything, like what they're eating for breakfast. And I don't want to see that. I don't care. So I'm not going to bore everyone with what I'm doing. I'll just, you know, if they want to come and hang out, then they can. But I'm not going to tell them from like a million miles away. So, hey, You guys got a new album out. Congratulations. Um, again, different stuff. Uh, the first thing that struck me is you guys will pl- probably did this way before lots of sampling yeah i think for us that's the new source of inspiration whereas before it was about picking up an acoustic guitar and trying to write a song and now that's kind of hit a brick wall and nowadays i go record shopping and that's the inspiration and you find sounds that inspire you and you instantly have something to work with you know the sample's there and you can the sample is like a really good band that you get to play with, you know? So that's why I like sampling. Now, of course, the whole law thing and the, the laws changed the ease with which a band could sample. Uh, a lot of people say after Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys, the world changed. Yeah. Um, you could, you cannot make a record like that anymore. Yeah, um, yeah well, actually, some of the samples we've used on the record, we didn't really have to credit people for, but it's the right thing to do, you know? So we chased people up and tried to give everyone the credit they deserved. I don't know. I think we've done the opposite of what other people try and do. Yeah, there were samples that our manager said, you know, this is too small, you don't need to do it. But I thought, I don't, I couldn't live with myself if, if someone, if I was getting credit for something which I've taken from somewhere else. So I wanted everyone to be credited. Um, a lot of the samples we used for from India as well, and they were about 50 or 60 years old. So sometimes the copyright doesn't even exist anymore. That made me think, actually, because there was the next question. If you use material that's older than 50 or 60 yeah. years, it's it's copyrights free. So let's say probably in another, hmm, well, maybe 15 years already, everybody can sample the Beatles and the Stones yeah. or whatever. Yeah. There'll be some great sounding records that you could just do whatever you want with. <laughs> it's going to be terrifying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but very exciting, I think. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you moved to, uh, around the globe uh, to, to write in order to write this song, uh, th- th- this album. Uh, you you found a barn somewhere in Holland where you stayed. Yes. Why? We um we, we were actually <laughs> just discussing that. <laughs> we were playing a festival here, and the weather was beautiful, and I just thought let's just stay, and we stayed for two weeks. I think <laughs> um, it was a barn just near Nikokovin. Is that a place? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was a very peaceful two weeks and we had a bike and just a tiny little barn and, you know, every day cycling to the town and getting a newspaper. And it was the kind of life that I would l- like to live when I'm older. But I had a little sneak preview of it. And then it started raining for two weeks and you decided to move <laughs> to Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I just followed the sun for this Sorry, album, really. I told my manager that I was writing, but I was just sunbathing mostly. <laughs> Hey, of course, the Indian influences are obvious on the album. Uh, the Turkish, if you delve a little deeper, but are there any Dutch influences at all? Um, I think the, the way of life over here probably influenced the the record. There are no Dutch samples or anything like that. Nothing, mm-hmm. nothing too wild. The first single that we released was actually written in Holland, that, and that was the first song for this album that came about. Yeah. So we have a lot to to thank Holland for. It was just great to have your own little space. Like I turned the barn into a little studio and just to have that freedom and and to be somewhere where you're happy, just to wake up every day and feel good, that makes you write really good music, I think. So that was the effect that it had, I think. A couple of songs that I liked on the new album. Uh, I think the starter is really good, overdone. Um, again, um, Touching uh, the Beastie Boys here, I think the guitar sound is a little bit like an old Beastie Boys record. Is is that anything you guys listen to at all? That never crossed our mind, I yeah. think, but that is true, yeah. A lot of people have referenced Paul's Boutique when listening to this album, yeah. and it, it's an album we obviously know, but I don't think anyone had it in mind. So what albums are you listening to when you wrote this, uh, th- those albums? Um, I was just either listening to lots of old Bollywood music or just jazz nothing very nothing very similar to the album i just started collecting old blue note beat uh, hard bop records from the like mid 50s to mid 60s wow it's a very small little window of jazz history that i want to compile you know a, a 
every record that was made. It's really, I mean, you're laughing about it, but it's amazing that you can actually, that it is an influence and you change it around so, so much mm. that it becomes totally new. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, usually it happens subconsciously, I suppose. Um, I don't think this record is like uh, albums that we can pinpoint that really it's obvious that they influence the album. Mm. I guess the whole culture of sampling. So a couple of years back, got really into early 90s hip hop and I bought a little MPC, which is what people like Pete Rock and DJ Premier would use. And they were like my heroes for a bit. So that's where the sampling came from, I think. Hey, a lot of uh, female vocals uh, also on this album. Yeah. Is it Lucy still? Yeah, Lucy's doing five or six songs. And then um, a girl called Ray Morris, who's from the north of England. And um, she's got the incredible, powerful voice, which really added like a new texture to the to some of the songs, which was really exciting for us. Mm. It was like learning to play a new instrument, you know, having this new sound. You know. And actually, it caused a lot of problems for us because we had these songs recorded and we were like, no one can sing like her and we can't take her on tour with her. So <laughs> we had to start to think about our live shows and change it around just because of her singing on them you know so how do you solve that because that was basically my next question a lot of female vocals there it sounds great on the album now you're touring live you can't take them all along we basically found this this girl from london who can sing like lucy and like ray morris no shit. and she's oh, yeah. she's crazy <laughs> we had to do like this it was like an x factor day where we all sat on this sofa gave the marks out of 10 and then <laughs> sent them out the door <laughs> Did you film that actually? <laughs> and of course, we, yeah, we made yeah, a show out of it. We made a TV that's... program. <laughs> Likely, it would have been great for uh, for your channel or whatever or your website <laughs> yeah. to have an official like we need a singer. Yeah. It would have been funny. I'm not sure if the results would have been that great. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Hey, the artwork is uh, is is great. Um, you guys hire a company to do your artwork, right? Why is that? Um, we've got different people to do each of the covers. And our manager actually put these, he showed me these guys called Laboka who did the cover. Yeah. And it's kind of exactly what I had in mind for this album cover. It's, they do really big, bold images, which is unlike anything we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a good representation of the music we we're making at the time, you know. It's very, I don't know. Vibrant. Vibrant, that's the word. And... We also started to look at the work of Edward Morrybridge. Jack found a, a picture of his that he really liked, and we kind of combined the two. We just gave these Edward Morrybridge uh, kind of references to Laboka, and they, wow. they did what they did. Cool. Hey, the first video also uh, for Carry Me was a special one, uh, interactive. Um, it uh, killed my computer, but <laughs> yeah. it, it looked really beautiful. Yeah, so... Um we were kind of thinking about the themes for the album and there's obviously a lot of um, looping and, and repetition and of the samples in the album. We wanted to interpret that in a visual way. And we thought if we did stop motion and sort of animation, it's kind of a similar thing to the, the creative process of the music. So again, like the artwork, it was influenced by this Edward Moybridge guy who pioneered animation and, um, we took it one step further and the the user can actually animate it, which was, you know, that was sort of kind of surpassed our expectations for it. So it was cool. Mm. Your videos are also are always really special. Uh, no, I'm oh, serious. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure all of us agree with that. I think this one's special particularly. This is the first one I think we've collectively been very happy with. Okay. I'm glad you like the other yeah. ones though. Well, they're really beautiful. Um, and their video is it still that important for a band to have a video, actually, in, in this time and day? I think if a band has a good idea and if a band is interested in, in visual arts, then it's a great sort of platform for that. But if a band is just doing it because they feel like they have to, then it's a complete waste of money. Because it almost looks like uh, Internet killed a video star, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I think lots of people discover music on YouTube, but they're not going to YouTube for the video. They're just listening to the song. And actually, personally, I think sometimes I see the budgets of these videos and it's an obscene amount of money. And I think if you're not actually doing it for a good reason, then you have no right to waste all that money, I think. Having said that, when someone does have a good idea and it's entirely justified, I, I, 
it's probably better having it on the internet than on music television because you can access it whenever you want. There's it, it kind of draws a lot of attention to a band who's got a good video. You can you listen to the song more and people start to talk about it. You guys, uh, are you guys, do you use Spotify or are you guys internet savvy at all? I mean, I use Spotify a lot. Yeah, um, the way I see it is, is I don't care if if we don't make much money off it. If it means that more people are discovering us and then coming to the concerts, then that's all that matters to me. I just want to see people at the shows, you know. You guys will be playing a tour soon, uh, UK first. You already did Ireland, I saw. We did it. An yeah. Irish tour, yeah. We come here on February. Cool. The February, yeah. <laughs> February, the, th- the February. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Find it online? Yeah, it'll be here on the screen now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we're But you're doing a European tour? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we start in Scandinavia and in Spain. I think it's about two and a half weeks long. And then in March, we do the UK. Cool. And then hopefully April and May, go to the US. So it's all the school getting planned out now. That's actually fun because uh, uh, I was reading this interview, guys, that you did online with fans and they could ask you questions. And there was one guy who said, I first listened to your music when I was in McDonald's. And I was like, <laughs> and he was an American guy. I was like, what? Yeah, I think that's how they discover music in America. It's just <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, it's always tr- like w- when we're in London, we we sometimes hear our songs when we're out and about. It's always when I'm hungover. I'm always just trying to get some breakfast, and I feel terrible. And then they start playing shuffle, and I'm just like, this is the fifth time it's happened. You know, it's terrible. Oh, you mentioned shuffle. Uh, the intro is a sample from something that you can't reveal, right? Oh yeah, we've we've never been able to say that. Well, But it relates to my collection of uh, Blue Note records. But that's all I can say. So shuffle, all chopped up and unrecognizable, but yet. Yeah, I think maybe the argument is that if they hadn't have created that piece of music, then you would never have found that inspiration. But I think if someone took something that I'd made and been really creative with it, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. I'd say you were the one that was creative, you know. And if they sold like 40 million cop- copies and made 10 million pounds. And I tell them to lawyer up because I'm coming <laughs> for everything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, that's the whole discussion with the Verve uh, doing... Uh, yeah. Rolling Stones, yeah. Because I wasn't... I'm a, I'm a Stones fan. I wasn't able to recognize that at all. I mean, you had to have the, the the orchestral interpretation of Andrew Luke Oldham on the Stones and then listen through the samples to find it. They took everything, didn't they, the Stones? They yeah. they Like, everything, everything. Yeah. yeah. Typical. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree with you with that one. That's... I think they made it their own thing there. Mm. <laughs> and they don't really they don't need it not that I guess Rich Dashcroft or any of those guys need it but it seems a little unfair back to the album um, the title So Long See You Tomorrow yep um, Jamie the guitarist came up with it I think he I think it, it was an old book that he found mm. it's, um, a, it's a William Maxwell book I think quite an old one I think he was He's the one that always interprets the lyrics. I never do. So he was listening to the album and he said that maybe there was a theme of of in a relationship you thinking it's you thinking oh finally it's ending this is good but then you just go back and repeat the same old stuff and so you're saying so long which kind of implies I'm never gonna see you again but then see you tomorrow is oh the next morning it's just happened again you know I guess it's like your vices you always try to rid yourself of them but they'll always find a way back. It's also a great song. Um, actually, most of the songs are pretty long, right? Four minutes plus. Yeah, I think when you're pr- when you're uh, when you produce your own album, you there's no one there to say, okay, that's too <laughs> long now. You can just go on forever. Well, do you agree? Do you think? I mean, do you care? You know, obviously you don't care, but I mean, radio-friendly songs has to be three minutes for thirty seconds. I think you only look at the time once you've finished the song, and then it's kind of just like, mm. oh, well, that's a nice surprise. Um, and we do do radio edits, but we like to get creative with them. So you do them yourselves. Yeah, yeah, we always do them ourselves. Cool. So it's like a good lesson in how to, you know, cut the fat from a song. Not I think. Yeah. I think it's also a really good song. Uh, so, so long, see you tomorrow. Um, it 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 doesn't listen. If you listen to it, it doesn't seem like it's too long. But when you saw when I saw it back, and I was like, wow, this is six minutes actually. Oh, to me, it's never dragged at all. No. 
And I, I don't actually, we thought about shortening it and I can't see what you would chop out that would make it a better song. You know, everything's meant to be there. How do you guys work actually? I mean, uh, it must be difficult. Are you the one who starts off with the song and then you guys get together and not, not? Yeah, so I, uh, I, um, so I w I, I'd sort of travel around, I'd bring my laptop, I'd be writing demos and then I'd email an MP3 to the guys. And so the good thing is they get to listen to it just as a listener you know they're not in, they don't have to be involved yet so you can be subjective whereas when you're involved in the creative process you lose all subjectivity you don't know if it's good or bad and so i have these three people who i trust more than anyone else to say this is good maybe work th on this more this has potential and so i think it's a very very healthy process so i guess you wrote a lot more songs than the ones who appear in the album yeah this time we did usually we don't Usually we've been a band that just writes, you know, we do all the editing before the song selection. But this time, actually, we were being much harder on ourselves. We were being much more critical. So there were songs which haven't made it onto the album, which if we were doing this two years ago, maybe we'd be putting on, you know, the third album. And that shows how, I think, ambitious we were with this record because th we were just being... Mm. We, you have to be critical if you're doing it yourself, you know. And there, there's 10 songs on this album, and I think a lot of people were like, that's not many songs at all. These guys have been lazy. But if you look back, there's, I don't know, 25, 30 songs in total. And then we, there, there's, obviously some of them are in different forms. Like some of them are the beginning of songs that we didn't continue any further. But there's there's a lot more there, and we had to really whittle it down to get what we wanted and what we thought was a consistent piece of work. Because 10 songs is like standard for vinyl yeah. that's what we thought so the album perfectly splits in half so side a and side b is almost two mini albums so we made sure that track five was had an ending that was really sort of poignant you know we we took a long time thinking about the structure of the album it was really important to us so you had vinyl in your mind when you composed the album of course so you should always have that in mind i think and especially for me, that's what I always think about when I'm doing artwork as well, because it has to be, it has to look great when it's a 12 inch. You have to be able to put it on your wall and, and you know, it doesn't even have to be music. It could be art. You know? Why is it such a different musical experience to have vinyl than, well, CDs or MP3s or Spotify? Or? It's, a, it's all about ritual yeah. and the amount of concentration that you're putting on the listening experience. So Spotify is like the complete other end of the spectrum where you would just put it on and you read a book or do something else and it's in the background it's like the radio and a vinyl you sit down you take it out you look at it for a bit you know you're it's this wonderful physical thing and you put it on and you're treating it with utmost respect you guys uh, issue uh 17 singles as well on vinyl we used to we we, we haven't for this album unfortunately we're making an extra seven inch that will go in this in the box set we're making and that's got some extra songs on that people haven't heard. So there will be a final box set. We've got this great box set which has heavyweight vinyl, so very, very good quality. And we've got seven inch. We've got a song book where we've written out in um, notation all the songs. So you can play it on your piano or on a saxophone or whatever you want. Wow. And then we have um, something called a fenakistoscope, which is a little disc and it has slits on the edge and you spin it around and look through the slits into a mirror and it creates an animation wow. and and that's the front cover it kind of goes back to what we were saying Edward Moybridge who we based all the artwork off invented this fenakistoscope thing and our artwork is actually one of them so we didn't need to do anything else to make it animate all we had to do is put it on a kind of we had to put it in the template and then it will animate for you mm. it's really cool Looking forward to find that. Um, I was about to, to insult you guys for being complete nerds, but... <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind. We're okay. happy with that title. We're nerds. What's this like? I mean, I think it's fantastic what you guys do. I mean, you are you are very online. You are very... In this whole album is sampled, yet you got your inspiration from basically the 50s and maybe earlier than that. Yeah, I think we're very traditional. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Sometimes. Hey, thanks so much uh, for, for passing by and uh, hope to see you guys soon. Cool. Thank you for having us. Thank you.